This sermon uh, is called uh, Shock Therapy, and uh, I don't think I've ever probably prayed or thought as much in terms of, I'm just really praying for the Holy Spirit to take these words and to use them um, in, in a way that's appropriate for you today, and that if perhaps there's some words here that aren't appropriate for you, that those would come fall away, and that, uh, and that the words that are appropriate would come home. And through the Holy Spirit. Um, who is Jesus Christ for us today? That was a question asked by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the Second World War. Um, I've got a little picture there of a book uh, by uh, an author called Adrian Plass. Some of you would have heard of him. Uh, Jesus, safe, tender, extreme. And um, it follows on a little bit from those pictures of Jesus we looked at before. Um, you know, we all have images of what Jesus is like. We all, I mean, as Christians, um, as many of us would, would call ourselves, we have probably our favorite kind of images of Jesus as well, don't we? Those, um, you know, I think of the, the um, popularity of Psalm 23, you know, the Good Shepherd, which is a wonderful image of Jesus, isn't it? And of course, Jesus describes himself as the Good Shepherd uh, in John's Gospel. Um, but I wonder sometimes if we can make our image of Jesus maybe a little bit too fluffy and a little bit too comfortable. Um, and in fact, I notice I, I teach um, religious studies at a secondary school. You know, I notice uh, in theology that sometimes Jesus, people lay their ideas on top of Jesus. Uh, I mean, even uh, the Nazi party had an Aryan Jesus um, who, you know, wasn't Jewish and, you know, uh, was, a, was a perfect kind of Aryan. So that's a challenging question, isn't it? Who is Jesus for us today? Um, I'm going to be honest about the passage uh, that we're looking at today. Um, this is actually, um, oh, I see Abigail all the way here. Right? <laughs> Oh, that's, that's horrible. Isn't it? Um, oh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the discipline of preaching through a gospel is that you have the nice bits and you have the difficult passages. Uh, and I did say this to Nick when he said, oh, this is a passage when I'm away. I was like, oh, cheers, Nick. Well, he said, he said, you can either do this one or you can do the next one that's on divorce. <laughs> so I thought, okay, um, I'll go with this. Um, I almost wish this passage wasn't in the Bible, um, and I certainly wish that Jesus' language was a little bit more moderate. Um, I don't know if you've heard of trigger warnings. You know, nowadays quite a lot of literature gets trigger warnings. <clears throat> in fact, they've got rid of John Steinbeck from English GCSE because of, you know, some of the words that are in Steinbeck's of mice and men. Um, but this is a passage with a trigger warning, okay? And it's a, it's a difficult one. And Jesus' language is very graphic. Hence why this is shock therapy. Um, I think the value of this passage is that it shocks us, is that it provokes us, is that it disturbs us. And it disturbs us from those comfortable views of Jesus the meek and mild Jesus who never kind of upsets anyone or never, never challenges people. Um, and this is a different Jesus. Um, this is this is the extreme Jesus that we are looking at in today's um, passage. Although, of course, the extreme Jesus is also the safe Jesus and the tender Jesus as well. Um, so the context, Mark chapter 9, we've been looking at for a couple of weeks with Nick already. Um, this is discipleship training. So Jesus is really spending time with his disciples. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 30 says, uh, they left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. So this is a moment when Jesus is specifically teaching his disciples, the 12, the leaders of the new Israel. Um, and he's, this also is the last time that Jesus is on home territory. So in Mark's gospel, 
from this moment on, he's heading towards Jerusalem. He's heading towards his destiny. He's heading towards crucifixion. Um, so it's an incredibly important moment. Time is very, very short. Um, and this is Jesus's, in a sense, his last moment with his disciples. Now, I have to say, and I think we know this already from Mark's gospel, the disciples still aren't getting it. Uh, do you find it kind of reassuring that the disciples are absolutely hopeless? Uh, because in Mark's gospel, they are absolutely hopeless. They do slightly better in some of the other gospels, but that's still the problem that Jesus has got here. Uh, and the other context, and that's there are my slides up there. The other thing is this emerging kind of warfare in Mark's gospel between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light um, and God's kingdom. And obviously that's been there the whole way, but it now feels like it's becoming more serious. Um, the battle lines are being drawn. Um, don't you know there's a war on these couple of posters from, from kind of um, the 20th century wars here. Um, and there's an urgency and there's a seriousness to what Jesus is saying here. The stakes suddenly seem to be very high. Um, careless talk costs lives. Interesting that, isn't it? Careless talk costs lives. The, I think the key, as I said, this is a really hard passage. I think the key to this passage is it's about the disciples in the kingdom of God. And I think the key is this. If the disciples, the 12 that Jesus is talking to, those that bear the name of Jesus, his representatives, those who pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God, if they get in the way of God's kingdom, the consequences of that are severe. In fact, they're terrible. If they end up getting in the way of the work of God, that is a terrible outcome. Jesus earlier in Mark's gospel says this, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. That's when Jesus is... Uh, accused by the Pharisees of casting out demons by the power of Satan. And he says, no, no, no. If a kingdom is divided against itself, if Satan works against Satan, that kingdom will not stand. And there's almost here, what came to mind is that horrible euphemism. I don't know if you've heard of it, friendly fire. Have you heard that? I remember it first probably in the Gulf War. This idea of being shot at by your own side. In the fog of war, you can end up killing people on your own side. And that, I think, is the key. The disciples cannot find themselves, end up obstructing the work of God. And I think that key kind of helps you when you look through uh, what we're about to read now. Okay, right, we're going to read the passage. Um, this is actually very, very good, this passage, in the message version of the Bible. Um, so I would... You know, I might encourage you to look at that. It looks like we've got the new revised standard version here, so we'll go with this one. Uh, so this is Mark chapter 9, verse 38 to 50. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of, a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. 
And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. But everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. That's nobody's favourite passage of scripture, is it, by the way? No one's got that on one of those memory verses. <laughs> okay, right, I'm off now. No. Um, right, uh, verse 38, let me just read that again. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to talk about the salt bit right at the end. I kind of ran out of time to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with the salt bit. Um, verse 38, teacher, we saw a man driving out demons in your name. And we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Um, so John's idea. So to me, this is about Christian leadership, really. Uh, so John's idea of Christian leadership is a bit like Alan Sugar in The Apprentice. Have you seen that? It's been going 20 years. Did you know that The Apprentice? Okay, so John, John's model of leadership is, is Alan Sugar. And if you know the if you know the show, you've got him there. This is his famous thing, isn't it? He sat on this big black chair, you know, on this big boardroom table. You're fired. He's right-handed. You're fired. And leadership is about status. It's about power. It's privilege. It's prestige. You know, they all fire him. They go, oh, Sir Alan, you're such a great person. Can I please work with you? Thank you for this opportunity, even when they're getting fired. Okay, that's John's idea of Christian leadership. Okay, deciding who's in and who's out, deciding, you know, it's all about privilege, it's all about prestige. In fact, in the next chapter, he still hasn't got it because he ends up asking to sit next to Jesus at the top table. Jesus says to him, You don't have any idea what you're asking. You're fired. So, and John's saying, Look, this guy's not one of us. We stopped him. We told him to stop. What's he doing? Not one of us. We're the leaders around here. What's this guy doing? By the way, have you noticed the irony again? If you if you can remember back in the previous story, the disciples couldn't cast a demon out of someone, if you remember, and Jesus had to come in and deal with the situation. Now they're criticizing someone who seems to be doing what they couldn't do. So I think there's more than a bit of envy here as well, isn't there? Someone seems to be being a bit more successful than we were. Let's put a stop to it. Okay. Jesus says, don't stop him. Don't stop him. You do not have a monopoly on the kingdom of God. You're not sat in that big chair deciding who's in and who's out. You're not in charge. You're not in control. Don't stop what God might be doing. I don't quench the spirit. And I think that's I think that's quite a powerful message, isn't it? Particularly perhaps for those of us who are in leadership roles or roles with responsibility, to not stop what God is doing. Um, Jesus' model of leadership, of course, is on the other side there, washing the feet of the disciples, service, humility, encouragement, love. Uh, Sarah Bessie in a book I've read recently, really good book, really enjoyed this, Out of Sorts. She said this, which applies, I think, to this story here. If we assume we hold the market on God's truth and redemption, we miss all the different ways that God is at work in the world right now. If we narrow the holy vocations to a select few, we turn a blind eye to the places where God is already active in the world. The redemptive movement of God includes all creation. God doesn't need our stamp of approval to do it work. In fact, I have often found evidence of God's presence in the strangest of places, far from our neat and tidy categories. It's reminded me of his vastness, 
his barren and shattering love, his wild and terrible habit of including the ones whom I forget. So the kingdom is greater than we can imagine. Jo John and the disciples are full of pride. They've got the wrong idea of leadership. It's like they're looking down the telescope the wrong way. Um, they seem to think God has to work in ways they understand, uh, and in ways they sanction even more so, uh, and God doesn't. They need humility. They need to find their worth in their relationship with Jesus, not with their work or their success as they see it. So that's the first bit. Now, Jesus kind of springboards from that into that. It might be good just to go back here. Um, he kind of springboards from that into this idea of reward and punishment, okay? Um, I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. It's almost like Jesus, this I think is the logic of this, it's almost like Jesus has just said, look, you just tried to stop someone from doing something in my name that was quite significant. Casting out a demon is quite a big deal, isn't it? Um, it's quite, that's quite a big thing. Uh, and it's public ministry. So this person was doing something obvious. The disciples have seen it. They've put a stop to it. And it, I, it feels like Jesus is kind of saying, look, you just stop someone from doing something quite major for me. Be very, very careful that you do not stop the little ones, we'll talk about that in a second, the little ones from doing small things for me. And this is the cup of water. The cup of water is kind of a small thing, isn't it? If someone gives you a cup of water, although if you live in the Middle East and it's 45 degrees Celsius, a cup of water is, is vital and life-giving. But it's, it's almost like he's saying, look, you just discourage this person from doing something big, be on your guard not to discourage someone from doing something small for me. And then you've got verse 42, which is a terrible, terrible warning. Uh, we'll talk in a minute maybe about Jesus's graphic language. Um, but this is a terrible warning, isn't it? Um, verse 42. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone around his neck. The little ones here aren't children. This is this is what this is what I've read. This is what I think. They're not children here, but they are disciples of Jesus. They are followers of Jesus. They're probably followers of Jesus who are just starting out. Maybe followers of Jesus that have a very simple faith. So perhaps a fragile faith, maybe people who are just finding their way as disciples. That's who the little ones are in this passage just yeah. And that little phrase, cause to sin, means to scandalize. That's a word in Greek, to scandalize. And it means to stumble or to make to stumble, to fall away or to lose their faith. And it raises a question, doesn't it? It raised a real question for me. What is my attitude to sisters and brothers in Christ? How do I treat you guys, basically? How do I, what is my attitude? How do I speak to other believers? How do I act? Particularly, particularly the little ones, particularly those that are more vulnerable particularly those whose faith is weaker. How, how do I act? What is my behaviour towards those? Uh, Paul has that phrase in Corinthians that I've got there. Be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Just because I can do something or I can think something or we have a freedom in Christ, but 
when does that actually become a stumbling block to someone else? And Jesus kind of takes it personally. You notice this. When um, Paul is on the road to Damascus and the bright light shines down and the voice comes out, um, can you remember what the question was? Why are you persecuting me? Well, he wasn't. No, he, Paul was persecuting Christians, wasn't he? But Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Because Jesus takes it personally. Because his children are his possession. It's the same, actually, in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Whenever you gave, whenever you served the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. So we must be, particularly those of us maybe that are more experienced Christians, maybe we've been on the path a long time, maybe we have responsibility for others, we have to be particularly mindful. Our actions have consequences. God forbid that we could end up stopping the work of God. God forbid that we could cause other people to stumble or fall. Uh, I've got a quote here from Barbara Brown Taylor on this passage. These scary words of Jesus are shock therapy, designed to get our attention and keep it. What we do matters. What we say counts. We have power we do not even know about. And it's absolutely crucial that we use it to build up and not to tear down. I don't know about you. I think I'd probably go around most of the time feeling I don't have any power and I don't have any influence. Do you have something to you, do you, I don't know how you feel, but I often think, oh, you know, I just don't have any influence here. I mean, parenthood's a great example, actually, isn't it? That's certainly, you, you've got this to come. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly, any influence you feel you have over the world kind of just disappears just like that. Um, but actually, is it the other way around? Do we actually have way more influence than we think, particularly as Christian believers, people are watching us, people are listening to us, aren't they? You may have experience of people kind of catching you out and saying, hang on a minute, I thought you were a Christian, why dot, dot, dot? Maybe we have more power than we think. Let's pray for our Christian leaders. Um, Rob has already done it this morning, but for those who bear a responsibility um, for the flock, I'm not even going to go into, but I know for some of you, you'll be very aware of Christian leaders who have fallen, you know, nationally and international Christian leaders who have fallen and have brought, have caused great damage. And that's that's the seriousness of what's being said here, isn't it? Right, let's go on. I'd like to say it gets a bit better, but... <laughs> um, right, finally. Well, I say finally. Jesus then goes, it seems, on to talking about disqualifying ourselves, shipwrecking our own faith. Don't shipwreck the faith of others. Don't cause the little ones to stumble but take responsibility for your own faith as well, lest you disqualify yourself. Now, these are very, very graphic warnings of the wages of sin. We trot that line out sometimes as Christians, don't we, and from Romans, the wages of sin are death. And yet Jesus here is really graphic about this. And um, I think the key with this language is that I think we're, we're to take it literally, no, sorry, we're not. We're to take it seriously, but not literally. Please don't come to church next week, you know, having lost a hand, a foot, or an eye, or I will. I'll be impressed by the power of this sermon, but I won't, I won't be happy. Okay. Take me seriously, but not literally. Jesus' language is, is exaggeration. It's an overstatement, which is a kind of rabbinical technique of teaching. 
Um, it's not quite, I did actually do a little bit of work on this, bit of a geek there. Um, it's not quite hyperbole, which is something that's absolute. So when a, a camel through an eye of a needle is impossible. It's not actually impossible to chop your own hand off, but it is an exaggeration. It's an overstatement. And if you think about it, actually, your hand, your foot, or your eye don't cause you to sin, do they, if you think about it? What does cause you to sin, Jesus has already taught us, is your heart. Your heart that causes you to sin. Your sinful desires come from within. In fact, chopping your hand off is not necessarily going to help you to avoid sin. Plucking your eye out is not. There is a horrible story about um, a saint from the dim and distant past called Oregon who removed part of his anatomy in order to more closely follow God. Um, but it's not actually that that causes it, is it? But I think, I think what's happening here is Jesus is saying, well, the obvious point is you've got to deal radically with sin. You've got to deal decisively with sin. You've got to, you've got to deal maybe painfully with sin but you've got to deal with it. The hand could symbolize what you do. The foot could symbolize where you go. The eye could symbolize what you see or what you look at. And these, so it's, it's dealing with sin and it's dealing with the tendency to sin as well. So I guess the hand, the foot and the eye is the tendency to move down a path that leads you into sin. Now, some of you here may, when I'm talking about sin, some of you may get a very clear idea of something. Some of us certainly suffer with besetting sins. So sins that have a strong hold in our life or sins that we repeat or become habitual. Some of us might have that as we talk about this passage. Some of you might not have that. And this, these images are repulsive, aren't they? Chopping your hand off, looking at an eye. These are repulsive images. In Deuteronomy 14, it says, don't disfigure yourself. Again, don't take it literally, but take it seriously. There's a, there's a kind of a yuck factor. There's a disgust about this. And I think actually that's Jesus's point. I think Jesus's point is the way we feel about sin should be disgust. We should be repulsed by sin. It should be absolutely oh, horrific to us. We should have that yuck factor about it. We should be disgusted by it. And our actions, and it's back to that warfare analogy, our actions have to be decisive. To enter life, to escape death, we must act decisively. Um, we've got Paul's, Paul's kind of um, reflection here, haven't you? Uh, I love this because I, I really like sports and all kinds of sporting endeavour. And um, so this picture of the athlete. Don't you realise in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? Run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. We do it for an eternal prize. I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline myself like my body, like an athlete, training to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might myself be disqualified. Don't disqualify yourself. Deal radically, decisively, and if necessarily, painfully with sin and what that means for you. Now, I still haven't quite got through the difficult stuff here. The language about hell. So Jesus talks about hell in this passage. Um, the word Jesus is used for this is Gehenna, which is, which is a place 
So the word that Jesus is used, uses is a physical place outside of Jerusalem, the Valley of Hinnom. Oh, is that right, Alan? Hinnom. I thought it was Hinnom, but it's Hinnom. Um, it's, I think it's east out of Jerusalem. Um, it was a rubbish dump at the time of Jesus. It was a place where there was almost a perpetual fire. Um, it was a, a place where rubbish was dumped. It smouldered with fire. It was a place that had associations kind of in the Old Testament times with child sacrifice to the god Molech. So it is a horrible, horrible place. And of course, Jesus' hearers, the disciples, would have immediately been able to picture this. They would have known exactly the place that Jesus was referring to. Uh, the quote, the horrible quote about worms and fire, comes from Isaiah 66, verse 24. And so that's a description of the destiny of God's enemies. Um, that's the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Again, this is revolting, isn't it? This is repulsive. This is disgusting. This is yuck. I don't know what makes you go yuck, but this makes you go yuck, doesn't it? And again, I think that's the point. Jesus wants us to be repulsed from a future without God. A godless future, a godless destiny is repulsive, is something that we should, by all means, flee from. I'm not, I'm not going to say much about hell. It's a controversial and widely debated topic amongst Christians. Even evangelical Christians debate doctrines of hell and precisely how that is to be understood. The point here is that this, I think, is the most powerful warning that Jesus gives. Notice he gives this warning to his disciples. And the warning is, avoid this destiny. Be repulsed by this. It is a powerful, powerful warning. The Bible says he disciplines those he loves. The Bible speaks of reverent fear of the Lord. Again, maybe this is something, if we've been around Christianity a long time, maybe sometimes we, we slightly lose the seriousness of it. The fact that there are two kingdoms, the fact that there are two destinies, the fact that this is a serious business. Um, and we must take these words of Jesus with utmost seriousness. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Two destinies. Two kingdoms, the battle lines are drawn. How do we respond? It's hard, isn't it? A passage like this. I don't want anyone to go away under condemnation. Um, I don't know what your understanding is of this. Um, when I think of condemnation, I tend to think of something that's vague, something that's kind of where you feel a bit hopeless and where you feel guilty in a kind of vague way. And I don't want anyone to feel like that. It may be, though, that we need to feel conviction. And conviction, I believe, is from the Holy Spirit. And when I've experienced and do experience conviction, it's usually specific, and it usually gives me I know what I need to do. I feel like I've got some agency, like there's an action I can take. So my prayer for this is not that you'd go away feeling bad or feeling hopeless or feeling fear or feeling guilt. My, my prayer is that if it's right from the Holy Spirit, that you'd feel conviction, that there would be a specific awareness of something that the Holy Spirit is saying 
as that. This is what to do. How should we respond? Do we need to? Do we need to renew our understanding of discipleship and Christian leadership? Uh, as we saw, the disciples, I'm afraid their view of Christian leadership is still pretty messed up at this point. It's amazing, really, isn't it, that they went on and did so well in the end. <laughs> Must remember that. Uh, do we need to consider the way we speak and act towards each other, to other Christians, particularly those, the little ones, particularly those who are vulnerable? Do we build up or do we tear down? What do our words and our actions do? Help me, God. Do we need to deal radically, decisively, and perhaps painfully with our own sin? Again, I think that's an individual thing. I'm sure in your own minds you can, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit will bring something to mind and say, there's that. Do we need to pray more for Christian leaders who bear responsibility? It's a big responsibility, isn't it? They are, I mean, Rob said it in his prayers, they're humans. And, and as James said, I really like that little bit. We've been studying the book of James, haven't we? I only got to one out of five, but <laughs> I really like that little phrase because it's a hard book, James, actually, isn't it? Rosemary doesn't like it much, I don't think. Maybe you've come to love it now, I don't know. But I love that little phrase that says, we all stumble in many ways. We stumble in many, many ways. <laughs> All discipleship leads to the cross. And Jesus is leading us from darkness into light. So maybe we need to do something. This is a powerful passage. This is a difficult passage. This language is graphic and repulsive in places. But that's Jesus's point, I think. Look at that verse there, though. This is what Jesus has done for us. And this is what we can be part of. Well, this is what we are part of. This is what we can be part of. This is what we can press into ever more. But he has rescued us. That horrible destiny that he talks about, that is repulsive images. We, we have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness. We've been transferred into the kingdom of his dear son, who has purchased our freedom and forgiven our sins. So that's our hope, isn't it? There's no hopelessness. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But there may be conviction. Um, I think I'll finish. Um, thank you, Lord, for even the difficult passages. Thank you for that you care enough that you are willing to challenge and to discipline and to give us it straight. Help us, Lord, to know how to respond. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy that triumphs over judgment. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he came and died and that he resurrected and that he sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to live up to the calling that you have given us in Christ. Help us, Lord, in our attitudes to others to build up and to not tear down. Help us to always be a sign that's pointed to your kingdom, your truth, your beauty, your love. And give us the grace that we need every single day to follow you. Amen.